In 1992, as a network news cameraman filming the L.A. riots, I came to wonder how we as a society had come to such a level of hatred. I decided to look back to a period of time, the 1960s, when people wanted human rights, when people thought they could change anything. And I wondered what happened to those people? What happened to that movement? And my questions became this documentary, All Power to the People. that there are more slums that Negroes are living in in the United States of America today than there were 20 years ago. Yes, that's right. The fact is that the Negro is more hovered up in ghettos today, more segregated in housing today that's right. than 20 years ago. Yes. The fact is that schools, particularly in the North, are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme Court rendered its decision outlawing segregation. These are the hard facts. And not try to solve these problems. We've got to rise up. We've got to organize. We've got to mobilize. And we've got to work to solve these problems. Well, it was a very controlled exercise. We were told what time to come into town, where we could march, where we could not march, the kinds of signs that we could carry. Um, the speakers were told what to say. When you say the march on Washington, you get the, 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 the perception that people are coming there angry or they're going to do something. Uh, it was a picnic. The um, final thing was we heard Dr. King's I Have a Dream. So everybody was emotionally clapping and so on. I felt quite sad uh, as I looked at the people because it was an empty dream to me. America has given the Negro people a bad check. A check which has come back marked insufficient funds. Whose time has come today. I had responsibility for protecting his life on the march from Selma Montgomery, and I spent five or six absolutely sleepless nights down there. We drive, I drive back and forth from Selma Montgomery, and I look at every tree and around every corner and wonder, and up on the roof and wherever. 
any sniper could be because I, I could feel the hatred drawn toward that place that wanted to kill him. And we had identified about 1,200 people who had histories of personal racial violence. I mean, they had tried to kill, they had assaulted, or they had murdered people on account of race, as far as I know, all whites, killing blacks. And here they were coming, they were drawn like a magnet towards Selma to Montgomery. And the man walked in the valley of the shadow of death for years, and he feared no evil. There were a lot of lynchings and things that were going on that you never heard about, because the news never got left the South. And uh, the federal government had taken a larger position of standing by and observing what was going on. The F FBI was not doing anything to protect the rights of the people who were peacefully demonstrating. When you say power structure, I know you mean the white power structure because that's all we have in America. And the white power structure today is just as much uh, interested in perpetuating slavery as the white power structure was a hundred years ago, only now they use modern methods of doing so. Uh, blacks being beaten by, with baseball bats and the fire hoses and the, and the dogs being sicked on blacks, marches and protesters and people who were trying to vote. It was uh, a very bit appeal to accept. If you only ask for crumbs and, you're, and the granting of those crumbs causes bloodshed, what do you think will uh, be caused when you ask for a loaf of bread or a bakery in which to bake your own bread? Well, let, me, let me continue with uh, this one. There had been a very intense struggle to uh, around the question of the denying black people the right to vote and access to public accommodations. And the South had been the focus of much of that struggle because uh, that's where the contradictions were most blatant. As long as the masses of black people are involved in the struggle for freedom, not integration, but freedom, and respect uh, as human beings, respect as men, and show that they're willing to die to be respected as men, then the power structure sits up and takes notice. Dr. King's a man of unparalleled nonviolence among public figures in American history. And he studied nonviolence, and he studied Gandhi, and he studied Tolstoy, and he studied Thoreau, and he absorbed their vision, and he came to understand that it was the only way that we'll avoid destroying ourselves. He could look at Hiroshima and he could look at our massive arms expenditures and how it starved people and blew their bodies apart and all the misery of it. He could look at soaring crime rates and he knew we couldn't go on like this. And he pleaded with us. Hoover felt that one way maybe to silence Martin Luther King would be to invite him to his office. J. Edgar Hoover said that Martin Luther King was a liar and Martin Luther King had accused him of being a racist in his selection of FBI agents. So Martin Luther King said, I will go to Washington and I will have it out with him. I will certainly make him take that back and apologize to me. And then he did come to see J. Edgar Hoover. And they went down the hall and walked in an office together to talk. Finally, I inquired, and they said Martin Luther King had gone out the, out of the door on the other side and had left. Something influenced Martin Luther King because I understand that at the end of the conference, he uh, told the press that uh, I think something to the fact that uh, Hoover was a great man. J. Edgar Hoover who was believed to have had a number of tapes of Martin Luther King experiences with women and that Martin Luther King was uh, horrified and, and that Hoover had accomplished his aim of shutting up Martin Luther King for the time being. Martin Luther King, poor boy, is, is uh, under the influence of the foxes. I should say under the control of the foxes and has been used by the foxes to lead the poor sheep right to the slaughter. Malcolm was not afraid to speak the truth, and this was an eye-awakening to people in general. I think even some of the whites started to see some things they could not see before. There are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you never see them going under the label of liberals. That, that white person that you see calling himself a liberal is the most dangerous thing in the entire Western Hemisphere. He's the most deceitful. He's like a fox. 
And a fox is almost, is always more dangerous in the forest than the wolf. You can see the wolf coming. You know what he's up to. But the fox will fool you. He comes at you with his mouth shaped in such a way that even though you see his teeth, you think he's smiling and taking for a friend. They falsely accused Malcolm X of being violent, which Malcolm X did not because all he taught people was self-defense. And self-defense doesn't mean you go out and attack someone, but you do have the right to defend yourself by any means necessary if you're in that position to defend yourself. Malcolm, to us, represented a voice. Why should the black man need some legislation to prove that he's a human being when you don't need any legislation to prove that whites are human beings? So I make this point because, to come right back to my initial statement at the outside of the program, you will never get real freedom and recognition between black and white people in this country without destroying the country, without destroying the present political system, without destroying the present economic system, without rewriting the entire Constitution. It will be a complete destruction of everything that America supposedly stands for before a white man in this country will recognize a black man as something on the same level with himself. Heads of governments and, and, and leaders of uh, revolutionary movements listened to him and were convinced that there was a legitimate problem, a human rights problem that black people had in the United States, which was being covered up and concealed. He hated all the things that decent people should hate. He hated racism and hypocrisy and oppression and the tyranny of those in power. And what he loved, he loved humanity. But of course, the humanity in this country because of the racism was not the kind of humanity that anyone could love. It would have to be a society that would have to be changed completely. I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you. was assassinated and I was at the Audubon Ballroom the day that it happened. It was a terrible thing to witness and there are a lot of things that happened there that day that I don't understand that have not, and a lot of questions that have not yet been answered. People are still trying to puzzle out a piece together what really happened and who was re really responsible in terms of the actual participants. We know that the United States government planned it, did all of the plotting and utilized the uh, used the nation of Islam and some of Malcolm's own people to bring him down. I found out later on after research that Gene Robbins was on the stage when Malcolm X got assassinated. He was a gold badge carrying detective. If you define what a bodyguard is, it's distinctly just that. You guard somebody's body with your body and that makes you a bodyguard. So now how come any of what's there is beyond me to jump in front of the bullets? They ain't supposed to be off the stage, down the stage, around the corner. Those are not bodyguards. The CIA is completely very powerful in this country. Nobody knows how powerful. The CIA had uh, liaison projects with uh, police forces all over the United States. There was a chance of detente between Malcolm and, and King at the time of Malcolm's assassination. Two of the people arrested for uh, the murder of Malcolm X were people that had not fired a shot that had hit the victims. These uh, activities were run by the counterintelligence staff of the CIA. It was put in counterintelligence in order to bury it as deep as possible within the agency and prevent exposure. I find it uh a little strange that the FBI has informant files on so many people who end up assassinating someone. If the CIA was doing it in New York, imagine they were doing it in country after country around the world. Ah, well, if they had not killed Malcolm X, probably the Black Panther Party would not have evolved. I found these 
Declaration of Independence piece, that first two paragraphs that said, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for any one people to dissolve the political bondage which have connected them with another, when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursues and invariably evinces a design to reduce a people under absolute despotism. Well, this kind of phrase and this kind of thinking and our understanding, particularly the way I was coming from and my decisions to help to create this organization was all about this need to change and alter the government to evolve some community control kind of political power back into the hands of African American people in the black community. So we went down to the Warren Poverty Office, three blocks from my house, it's right there in North Oakland. And we sit down and decided right there by October 15th and start writing out this 10 point platform and program for this new organization. Many people don't understand that the Black Panther Party's 10 point program and platform was basically a statement of principles. And it was around these principles that we organized in the black community. Point one said we want power. We want power to determine the destiny of our own community. And it went through a series of issues. We wanted decent housing. We wanted to determine the destiny of our community. Decent education taught us about our true history. Uh, we wanted fair treatment in the courts, juries of our peers. We wanted to end to police brutality. We wanted a relevant education that taught us who we were and our role in society. Uh, we wanted land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, and peace. We wanted to organize political, electoral, black community power. The point was not to show what the government was not doing. The point was to show the community how the community could empower itself and how the community could organize. So we wrote this program, 10 points of what we want, then 10 collateral points of what we believe. And these principles and, and stated um, objectives of the Black Panther Party were the heart of his program. We still didn't have a name for this organization. I had gotten a pamphlet from the Lowndes County Freedom Organization. So I said, Huey, why do you got this logo for this panther here? And another point that day, Huey said, you know, I think the nature of a panther is, is that if you push it in the corner, and if it can't go left and it can't go right, it's going to tend to come out of that corner to wipe out the aggressor who pushed it in the corner in the first place. I said, that's what the races have done, Huey. They didn't push us black folks into the corner. And we decided to name it the Black Panther Party at first, and then we said, well, wait a minute, we're going to take position on self-defense and me and Huey agreed in the Black Panther Party for self-defense. So that was the night, October 22nd, the finalizing founding evening night. Because this is what happened. Huey was saying, okay, we're going to have to have some officers. So I flipped the chairman, a coin, a silver dollar. I flip, I say, heads, I'm chairman. Boom, it landed on heads. I say, I'm chairman. I go ready to hand Huey the silver dollar and I pull back. I says, you don't need to flip. So Huey say, uh, what do you mean I don't need to flip? I says, wait a minute, Huey. I says, there's only two of us. Oh, that's right. Uh, I says, you automatically minister defense. So I, I chairman. Yeah. Huey and Bobby said, we want to immediate end the police brutality and the murder of black people. That was rampant in the Bay Area, all over the country. It's always been a society of working class whites pitted against blacks. They had nothing else they could do but be police and try to come out of their uh, Oklahoma Dust Bowl, I'm gonna kick your ass nigger kind of attitude. There was a, uh, an incident where a police had shot a black man in the back and then went and planted a gun next to him and said that the guy had drawn a gun on him, which we found out after investigation, the guy didn't have no gun. Police had shot him in cold blood. Then they had another example where another black man was shot. But every young black man that was being shot during that time, the police never got indicted for murder or nothing. If anything, they got a promotion. Oakland has one of the highest infant mortality rates among black people across the United States. Add to that miseducation, unemployment, police terror, and the rest. This all helped give rise to the Panther Party at, in that particular place at that time. The real first patrol was down on 7th Street in West Oakland, California, where 11 or 12 brothers that night. Huey, Bobby, little Bobby Hutton, the Forte brothers, Sherman, who was also a part of that first cadre, and Albert Bitman Howard. I'm telling Huey on the walkie talkie because I'm riding in the lead car. Hugh, we got a policeman down here. There's a lot of people down here in the corner. Let's get out here, man, because he's arresting somebody. We pull over. We park legally. 
We're a hundred and some feet away. We all pile out the cars. We are a well-organized group, and we're observing the police under the law, and we're not going to take any crap from them if they do try something. But we want to recruit the people. We're trying to capture the imagination of the people in the community to let them know. So I think somebody I remember saying, what they got, sticks? Because, you know, it's dark, and people don't expect to see people with guns, black folks, right? And it's, it's nighttime, like. And somebody said, man, no, those some goddamn guns. And somebody said, I'm getting the hell out of here. Huey tells this brother who says, I'm getting out of here. He says, no, 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 you don't have to leave. We're a new organization. We're the Black Panther Party. We're here to observe these police out here. We've been brutalizing our people in the community. So please stay. We research the law. Everybody know we have a right to observe the police. Well, that got the police's attention. He stands up. You have no right to observe me, he hollers at Huey. But Huey says, no. Huey is citing the specifics of the damn law. And some sister in the audience said, well, go ahead on and tell it. And another brother said, what kind of Negroes is these? And the cop says, well, is that gun loaded? He said, if I know it's loaded, that's good enough. This scene, man, is a scene where, bang, when Huey says, Clap. if I know it's loaded, that's good enough, it calls little Bobby to say, yeah, that's right, I am a Jack around the chamber. Clap. And the other brother with the long guns, Clap, 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 Clap. and the cop turned around and saw all these people jacking the rounds off in the chamber. It blew his mind. He was awed. He stepped over to his arrestee. He opened the back door. Unconsciously, he protected the arrestee's head, put him in the car, shut the door. Then he stopped to look at the sister. And he was shocked because the sister had the earrings on. That well, female was even there with a big old 44 strapped down something like Clint Eastwood or something. Well, what are we doing? We passed out the 10-point platformer program. Political education session meeting is at 2 p.m. at 5624 Grove Street up in North Oakland. Please be there, brothers and sisters, because we're going to organize some political electoral community power in the black community. That's how the Black Panther Party got started. The party was able, came on the scene at a time in which black people um, had become increasingly frustrated at uh, conditions in this country. Uh, the whole black revolt was, as far as I was concerned, a little late coming. They should have gone forth with their activities much earlier than they did. I came into the Black Panther Party uh, and knowing about the Black Panther Party, uh, as a student at San Francisco City College, uh, you had people such as uh, Mimar Baraka, which is known as Leroy Jones at that time. You had Kwame Torre, which was Stokely Carmichael at that time. And you had Rap Brown, and you had Sonia Sanchez, all those different people. It was through going through the Black House. Uh, I came in contact with some brothers named Huey and Bobby, who used to come through there from time to time. May 2nd, 1967, when I led a delegation to the California State Legislature, 24 males and six females. But Ronald Reagan was on the lawn, all the little kids he was speaking to out there on the front lawn left. These are little white kids, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 years of old. They came over, they thought we was a gun club. You need 30 yard six on the little kids were saying. But the press followed them too. Therefore, I read executive mandate number one, written by myself, Huey Newton, and Eldridge Cleveland. The Black Panther Party for Self-Defense calls upon the American people in general and the black people in particular to take careful note of the racist California legislature, which is now considering legislation aimed at keeping the black people disarmed and powerless at the very same time racist police agencies throughout the country are intensifying the terror, brutality, murder, and repression of black people. That gave us international notoriety because we were arrested and we was all bailed out the next day or so, et cetera, and boom. Your hands up. At a traffic stop, an altercation occurred. A police officer was killed, Huey Newton was wounded, and went to jail. Uh, I will be uh, free, uh, providing that we're successful in the battle that we're engaged in now, and that is to uh, revolutionize the court system. It all depends upon on this uh, problem. Huey was facing the gas chamber, uh, Bobby Seale and a handful of all the other members who'd gone to Sacramento were in jail. They were serving time. So it really wasn't much of an organization. At that point, the, actually, the Black Panther Party had totally fell apart. It didn't exist. I was in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, so I came out then in November of 1967 to uh, work with Eldridge, organizing the support around Huey's case.
Do you have any money? Uh, no, I'm, I'm in a severe state of poverty. What about the Huey Newton uh, Defense Fund? Uh, I don't know too much about the Huey Newton Defense Fund, actually. Who's paying leaving? your attorney's fee? Uh, I believe the Huey Newton Defense Fund. <laughs> I come out of jail. Elgin's Cleaver is back because Huey has been shot. He has put out one issue that says, Free Huey. Free Huey! Free Huey! Peoples of the world are demanding that Huey P. Newton be set free, so in defense of our lives, for the survival of black people and human beings of the world, we all say in solidarity that Huey P. Newton must be set free or the sky is the limit around the world. I reorganize and restructure the party. I extend the rules of the party in a matter of two months to 28 rules. You know, I create uh, the captain and David Hilliard's position and stuff. I create all of this stuff. Black Panther Party has revived it's changed its name from the black panther party for self-defense to the black panther party it's become very widely acknowledged organization in the bay area i was deputy chairman of student nonviolent coordinating committee put me in touch with a lot of people in the panther party the alliance uh, was formed in 1968 the panther party emerged in oakland california and did not have a national base SNCC had a much longer history, had uh, in many ways more seasoned activists. H. Rap Brown was drafted into the Black Panther Party as Minister of Justice. Kwame Ture was, uh, or Stokely, was drafted as Prime Minister of the Afro-American Nation. James Foreman was drafted as Minister of Foreign Affairs and Director of Political Education. I can remember seeing on television people like Stokely Carmichael and others. Violence is a part of America's culture. It is as American as cherry pie. Against all forms of racism. And they were scary to me even. So uh, if it were chock a person like me being in the CIA, certainly the ordinary society and the elites, above all, who run the United States, would have been very threatened. Black power means... Dignity! See, it's no in-between. You're either free or you're a slave. There's no such thing as second-class citizenship. The only politics in this country that's relevant to black people today is the politics of revolution. That we must arm ourselves. That we are in imminent danger. That the concentration camps in Tule Lake and Arizona and Oklahoma are now being rejuvenated Reset up for us, and we will defend ourselves. Uh, I don't believe in guerrilla warfare. I think it would be both impractical, ineffective, and immoral. Uh, so I can't uh, believe in this at all. I think we must see, on the other hand, however, that the young militants are in the revolutionary spirit. And uh, they are concerned about revolutionizing uh, certain values that have been existing in our society that need to be revolutionized. And I think the other thing that we must see is that, as President Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible only make violent revolution inevitable. to the Vietnamese people, the National Liberation Front, uh, to fight the cowardly American aggressor. Who's and with the, the Black Panther the Party. Panthers. That's right. The question is whether our nation has the will 
And I submit that if we can spend $35 billion a year to fight an ill-considered war in Vietnam and $20 billion to put a man on the moon, our nation can spend billions of dollars to put God's children on their own two feet right here on Earth. I'm going to uh, make this known at the Paris peace talks so that uh, it can be accepted or rejected uh, by the Vietnamese people, but in the spirit of internationalism and the spirit of international. fact is that there are more slums that Negroes are living in in the United States of America today than there were 20 years ago. Yes. That's right. The fact is that the Negro is more hovered up in ghettos today, more segregated in housing today That's right. than 20 years ago. Yes. The fact is that schools, particularly in the North, are more segregated today than they were in 1954 when the Supreme yeah. Court rendered its decision outlawing segregation. These are in 1992, as a network news cameraman filming the L.A. riots, I came to wonder how we as a society had come to such a level of hatred. I decided to look back to a period of time, the 1960s, when people wanted human rights, when people thought they could change anything. And I wondered what happened to those people? What happened to that movement? And my questions became this documentary, All Power to the People. try to solve these problems we've got to rise up we've got to organize we've got to mobilize and we've got to work to solve these problems well it was a very controlled exercise we were told what time to come into town, where we could march, where we could not march, the kinds of signs that we could carry. Um, the speakers were told what to say. When you say the march on Washington, you get the, 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 the perception that people are coming there angry or they're going to do something. Uh, it was a picnic. The um, final thing was we heard Dr. King's. Act. 